So I can start? Yes. <laughs> so according to the slide, my subject today is maximal non-bases. Uh, so let me review a little bit of the terminology. Uh, <clears throat> ooh, a set of non-negative integers. Yes, I said, is an asymptotic basis uh, of order h. Uh, if every number from some point on is a sum of h elements of the set. And if your set is not an asymptotic basis uh, of order h, then it didn't take a great leap of uh, imaginative terminology to call such a thing a non-basis. Uh, so a set is a non-basis of order h if there are infinitely many numbers that cannot be represented as the sum of h elements of the set. And uh, dual to the notion of a minimal basis, we have the notion of a maximal non-basis. So if you have a set of integers that is an asymptotic non-basis of order h, and if you take any number not in the set and add it to the set, and miraculously it becomes an asymptotic basis, then we call the set A a maximal asymptotic uh, non-basis uh, of order h. Yes, there's a phenomenon that every time you look at a slide, a new typo appears. Um, so um, in the original paper on this subject, the only examples of maximal asymptotic non-bases that were known uh, were constructed as unions of congruence classes. And uh, this uh, first somewhat ancient result uh, is really just a characterization of unions of congruence classes that form uh, asymptotic non-bases. And um, uh, it's a little bit technical to write down, but uh, it shows that a lot of these maximal asymptotic non-bases of congruence classes exist and in some sense describes them. So, uh, and at that time, there were several open problems, and two of them were the following. Um, we had shown already that if you have um, an, an asymptotic basis of order h, it might contain a minimal asymptotic basis, and it might not. But that question for non-bases wasn't known. Um, uh, it wasn't known whether every non-basis was contained in a maximal non-basis. Uh, also, it wasn't known whether there were any uh, maximal asymptotic non-bases other than these unions of congruence classes. And in particular, uh, can you construct a maximal asymptotic non-basis of zero density? So, so both of these questions have been answered, uh, at least for bases of order two. Um, but the first result is that I'm, that I'm going to, I'm actually going to try and prove two things this morning. This is one of them. So, um, so here is the question. You, you have a non-basis. That means you have a set of integers, and there are infinitely many numbers that aren't represented as sums of, let's say, two of them. Um, and this has a particular property. Um, you can add any element to the set, and it still is a non-basis. You can add any finite number of elements to the set, and it still is a non-basis. Um, and this first somewhat curious result of Erdős and myself says that if you have a non-basis with the property that if you add any finite set of numbers, it still is a non-basis, there must exist an infinite set, which you can add, which turns the set into a maximal non-basis. So it still is a non-basis, but now it's maximal. And uh, there's some simple corollaries of that. For example, every finite set, <coughs> every set with large enough gaps uh, must be contained in some maximal asymptotic non-basis of order two. Uh, so to give a kind of flavor of how some of these results are proved, um, in this case, this is what we do. So we're going to construct, so our, our initial set, we're starting with this set A. Uh -huh. Where is it? There it is, A. Uh, and you add any finite set, and it still is a non-basis. So we're going to construct an increasing sequence of sets, and also a strictly increasing sequence of integers with the following properties. So you get from one set to the next, always by adding just a finite set. So every set in this sequence is an asymptotic non-basis. Um, every element that you add, like, what you add to the set a sub k minus 1 to get the set a sub k, 
This will be a finite set of positive integers, but bigger than n sub k minus 1. And in fact, the numbers n1 up to n sub k are the k smallest integers not in the sum set 2a sub k. Again, each of these sets is a non-basis, so each of these sum sets is missing infinitely many numbers, and there's certainly going to be at least k numbers not in the sum set. And finally, um, if you have a number x in the set, uh, and if you have a number x less than nk over 2, and it's not in the set nk, then it's a sort of complement with respect to nk is in the set. And the claim is that if I take the union of these non-bases, I get a maximal asymptotic non-basis. So this is just repeating the properties. You have this increasing sequence of sets with these three properties. Um, so the first thing I want to show is if I look at this, um, the union, so I'm letting A star be the union of all these sets. And I want to show that this is a non-basis. And in fact, the numbers not in this set, not in the sum set, are precisely the numbers in the sequence n1, n2, and so forth. So if you take a number n, which is not in the sum set, then it's not in 2a sub k for any of the k's. And in particular, because you have an infinite, strictly increasing sequence of integers, there's going to be a k where n is between n sub k minus 1 and n sub k. But how do we choose n sub k? n sub k was an element of the sum set bigger than nk minus 1. Sorry, it's, the, it's an element not in the sum set bigger than n sub k minus 1. And it's, the, and it's the smallest such. So it has to be equal to n. So the only numbers missing from the sum set must be these n sub k's. So the, uh, so the infinite set of numbers missing from the sum set are the n1, n2, and so forth. Now, if you take any number that's not in the set a star, then it's not in any of these uh, sets a sub k. Um, if you take k large enough, it's going to be bigger than 2x. Uh, but if, oops, what happened to it? There we are. Uh, but if x isn't in a sub k, and n sub k is bigger than 2x, then n sub k minus x is in n sub k, which is in this larger set n star. Which means if you add x to the set a star, you can represent nk as x plus nk minus x. So if you adjoin this element x to a star, you in fact get every sufficiently large number that has been missing from uh, adding a star to itself. So a star is a maximal asymptotic non-basis. So, yes. Um, this is part of the, uh, uh, it's like wandering in the botanical garden of bases and non-bases, and you find these exotic species. And uh, the species are theorems, and they're all somewhat exotic. Um, so, um, but what about the original question? The original question was, uh, is it the case that every asymptotic non-basis must be contained in a maximal non-basis? So about this time, I gave a um, um, colloquium talk somewhere, and I mentioned this problem. And there was a guy in the audience who did uh, sort of functional analysis. He didn't know any number theory at all. But he studied sequence spaces. And he thought about this. And a couple of weeks later, he actually was able to prove that, in fact, not every non-basis is contained in a maximal non-basis. <clears throat> so let's see. Uh, where did it go? Uh, yes. So Julian Hennefeld um, gave the following very beautiful construction of a non-basis not contained in a maximal non-basis. So we start as follows. Um, take a set of integers, strictly increasing set of positive integers, where the successive differences get bigger and bigger and bigger. Let's go to infinity. And I want to take the very simple set, um, the number 1, and all multiples of h except those um, which are in the set u. So u h, so you look at all, all multiples of h, v times h, where v is not an element of u. And um, so this is an asymptotic non-basis of order h that is not a subset of a maximal asymptotic non-basis. So let's prove that. Um, 
So here is my set. And suppose we take a number n, which is congruent to r mod h, for any r which is not h minus 1. So I want to show, so the idea is to show that if I take the h-fold set sum of this set, I get everything except certain numbers that are congruent to h minus 1 mod h. So if I take a number which is congruent to r mod h, and r, does, r is different from h minus 1, I want to show that n must be in the h-fold sum set. So take any element in the set A. V, it's a multiple of h. Take v naught h. So there's some i naught where this difference between successive elements of u is bigger than v naught. Um, so suppose our number n, it's some, uh, suppose it's u sub i h plus r where ui is one of those bad numbers that's in the set u. Um, and i is bigger than i naught. But then ui minus v naught is not in u because ui minus v naught is bigger than ui minus 1. And these, are and these are successive elements of the sequence u. So ui minus, there should be a parenthesis around ui minus v naught. ui minus v naught times h is an a, so I can write n as this element of A plus this element of A plus R1s, and I fill it in with zeros. Zero is in the set. Um, and if N is R mod H, and it's actually V times H plus R, then it's easier because VH is, element, is an element of the set A. So you take VH, add R1s, and add enough zeros so you have H sum ends. So if n is any number which is not congruent to h minus 1 mod h, and n is large enough, then it's in the sum set. Um, so we only have to worry about numbers which are congruent to h minus 1 mod h. Um, if n is v times h plus h minus 1, you just write it as vh plus h minus 1 once. The bad case, or the awkward case perhaps, is when n is uh plus h minus 1, and u is an element of that set capital U. But if you're going to write a number which is congruent to h minus 1 as a sum of h elements of the set A, in that set A, you just had the number 1 and then multiples of h. So the only way to get a number which is h minus 1 mod h is to take h minus 1 ones plus the multiple of h, but the multiple of h is missing. So that means every number of this form where n is not in HA, uh, where n, where u, n is uh plus h minus 1, uh, and u is in u, this, every number of this form is not in the sum set. And there are infinitely many of these numbers, and so a is not an asymptotic basis. a is an asymptotic non-basis of order h. Let's show that it's maximal. So, if you take a number b, which isn't in the set a, and congruent mod h to something other than 0, then there's sort of the analogous little arithmetical trick or fact uh, that if you add this element b to the set a, you can actually represent every number. The only numbers you have to worry about are numbers of this form. And you can represent all of them if you add a number which is congruent, which is not 0 mod h. So any number which is not 0 mod h cannot be added to the set A. If you were to do that, it would turn from a non-basis to a basis. So we only have to consider elements that are not in the set A, which are, <coughs> which are 0 uh, mod h, which are multiples of h. Um, and in fact, well, but, but what are the multiples of h that aren't in the set? They're just the numbers of the form u times h. So we're back to this very uh, um, familiar situation. You have the set A. It consists of 1 and certain multiples of h. The multiples of h that are not in the set, those are those u times h numbers. If you add a number uh, you will pick up the missing number in the sum set uh plus h minus 1, and no others. So what numbers can you add to the set? You can add to the set any any set of, multi, any, any set of uh, numbers u times h, um, so you take some set, well, what did I call it, u prime. If you take a set u prime, uh, you can add u, u times h for u and u prime, so long as 
there are infinitely many elements of the set U that you haven't added. That is, you can add any set of these multiples of H whose complement is infinite. And there's a uh, simple fact that uh, if a set has infinite complement and you add an element to it, its complement is still infinite. So there's no maximal set whose complement is infinite. So there's no maximal set of these multiples of H that you can add to the set A to get a, not, to get a, a maximal non-basis. Um, so this is a set which is a asymptotic non-basis of order H and not contained in a maximal non-basis. Right? That's the art. And this idea subsequently was used over and over and over again to construct non-bases with additional properties that aren't contained in maximal non-bases. Now, <clears throat> once you get into this business, you can say, um, so what is a maximal non-basis? You have a non-basis, and if you add any element, it flips and becomes a basis. Suppose you want to do something slightly fancier. Suppose you want to know, can you have a, a non-basis with the property? I can add any element to it, and it still is a non-basis. But if I add two elements, it becomes a basis. Right? So, yeah. Or maybe more generally, if you take some positive integer s, you, want, you can define at least the notion of a, of a um, s maximal non-basis. So you have the set of integers. It's not a basis. You add a number, it's not a basis. You add another number, it's not a basis. You add s minus one numbers, it's not a basis. But when you put in s, the s number, it flips. It becomes a basis. Um, it's kind of like dark matter. You, you don't know whether these things exist or not or what they look like. But, um, uh, and let me recall also that uh, a basis of order h uh, has to grow at least like, uh, the, the counting function has to be at least like x to the 1 over h. And we say an asymptotic basis is thin if its counting function is bounded above by some constant times x to the 1 over h. And uh, there is a theorem uh, that says for every s, there exist s maximal asymptotic non-bases of order 2. Right? These things can all be constructed. And uh, there's one miraculous way to construct practically everything uh, that has an exotic property. Um, oh, sorry, and also for every S, uh, there is a thin S maximal asymptotic non-basis of order uh, two. So, um, yeah. And there's a thin asymptotic non-basis of order two uh, that is not contained in a uh, maximal asymptotic non-basis of order two. The example of Hennefeld is essentially uh, um, has positive density. It's uh, basically uh, it's a congruence class. Oh, um, huh. something disappeared. Um, excuse me. I did. Let's see. Well, maybe not. Um, so most theorems, as I said um, yesterday, uh, we can prove for bases of order two, but not for bases of higher order. Uh, but there's a very beautiful theorem of Jean-Marc and George Grecos uh, that deals with these asym S maximal asymptotic non-bases of order, uh, of any order. So for every s greater than or equal to 1 and every uh, order h, you can construct, they construct a thin uh, s maximal asymptotic non-basis of order h, and they also construct uh, a thin asymptotic non-basis of order h, which is not contained in a maximal asymptotic non-basis of order h. Um, okay. okay. Um, and this is really a beautiful paper. Uh, it's, uh, they had to do a lot of work to, to get this. Okay, now, um, I want to, so when you have, remember, what is a minimal basis? A minimal basis is a basis, you take away one element, and it flips and becomes a non-basis. 
Um, you could, just as we defined S maximal non-basis, you can define an R minimal basis. You can have a basis, let's say a three minimal uh, basis, would be a basis with this property. You have a set of integers, every number from some point on is a sum of two of them. Take away an element from the set, any element, still has that property. Take away another element, it still has that property. But take away any third element and it no longer is a basis, it becomes a non-basis. So that we call an R minimal basis. So a basis is R minimal um, if, you, if you take a, a subset F of the, uh, of the basis, the A minus F when you take away F, this is a basis if F has strictly fewer than R elements and a non-basis if F has R or more elements. So what we call a minimal basis is a one minimal basis. And we can also uh, talk about an Aleph naught minimal basis. This would be a basis from which you can remove any finite set, but no infinite set. So this I constructed yesterday. This gives an example of a basis that contains no minimal basis as a subset. Because from the set, you can take away any finite number of elements, but no infinite number. And not, uh, since there's not a maximal finite set and an infinite set, there's no way to take away enough from the basis so it becomes minimal. OK, now, all of these things can be constructed. Um, and the first way, and my sort of favorite way uh, in which this is done, uses a set that I constructed yesterday. Um, so we take a set of odd integers, 2q sub k plus 1, uh, where the q sub k's grow um, exponentially fast, satisfying this inequality. And then there's a certain set AQ, which is a, set, which is a union of uh, intervals. So square brackets from, this means the interval of integers from here to here. Um, so this, this set, this union of intervals is the set AQ. And it, had, it has a, uh, some remarkable properties um, that lets you, uh, uh, cajoled into doing all sorts of uh, curious things. So, for example, one can show that uh, this set is contained in, for any R, you can expand this set a little bit and get an R minimal basis. Uh, you can expand this set a little bit and get an Aleph naught minimal basis. Um, that's what I did um, yesterday. And you can also show, not using this set by, by a little bit different argument, that if you have, that there does not exist a basis with the property that you can delete any um, sort of subset of density zero, but no subset of positive density. That is, there's no, there's no basis from which you can delete, you know, zero density of the terms and still have a basis. Um, um, but if you delete any set of positive density of the subsequence of the terms, uh, it would no longer be a basis. Similarly, oops, um, we call it a set S maximal. If you can add any uh, up to S minus one elements to the set and it still is a non-basis, but if you add S elements, it becomes a basis. And again, using that set AQ, um, every set AQ is contained in some S maximal non-basis, uh, but there doesn't exist an Aleph North maximal non-basis. That is just a restatement of the theorem with Erdős that I proved at the beginning of the talk. Um, double oscillations. Yeah. Um, so the idea is... Um, you have a basis, and maybe you take away something and it becomes a non-basis. And then you put in something and it becomes a basis again. Right? I mean, I don't know. It seems sort of strange. Um, I mean, I don't know whether it's stranger that these things exist or stranger to think of looking for them in the first place. Um, so, so consider sets that oscillate from basis to non-basis to basis, or from non-basis to basis to non-basis. Um, so A is a set of non-negative integers. F is a finite subset of A. 
And G is the finite set of non-negative integers not uh, uh, disjoint from A. G intersect A is empty. So we'll call A an R comma S basis if it has the following properties. If you take away less than R elements from any set of less than R elements from the set A, it still is a basis. But if you take away R elements, it becomes a non-basis. But then if you put back up to um, less than S elements, it stays a non-basis. But if you put back S elements, it becomes a basis. So you can actually somehow control the, the rate at which these things are uh, changing. And uh, our, uh, my favorite set AQ can also be expanded uh, so that these RS bases exist and you can construct them from the set AQ. Um, what about uh, in the opposite direction? So again, we take a set A of non-negative integers and we take finite sets F and G. F is contained in A and G is disjoint from A. And we say that a set is an SR non-basis if what, you start adding elements to A and it stays a non-basis up until you put in S elements and then it becomes a basis. And then you can start taking elements away and it stays a basis. And finally, when you take away exactly R elements, then it becomes uh, a non-basis again. And as you would expect, these things exist. And starting from the set AQ, um, you can add elements in a sufficiently devious way to construct an SR non-basis. Um, ah, OK. Um, So what is the maximal element in this uh, collection of curious theorems? Um, this is it. Um, so I mentioned this um, yesterday. So you can partition the natural numbers into um, two sets A and B such that A is an infinitely oscillating basis and B is an infinitely oscillating non-basis. Uh, so what that means is you, part, you have this, the non-negative integers, A union B, A and B are disjoint. A is a basis, B is a non-basis of order two. Everything here is of order two. So from the set A, every number from some point on is the sum of two elements of A. From the set B, infinitely, num infinitely many numbers are not sums of two elements of B. But take any number in A and move it to B. A is no longer a basis, it's a non-basis, but B has become a basis. Take any element from B with this one element to join, move it back to A, the basis non basis properly flips back to what it was. And this process can be, considered, can be uh, continued forever. As you at random move elements from one set of the partition to the other, the basis non-basis properly oscillates back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, okay. All right, so now, <laughs> now I'm going to stop because uh, in my head I thought this was going to be a talk that was way too long. And I actually written a ton of slides sketching a proof of this. And I thought it was, well, I mean, no chance of even talking about that. Um, so uh, these are just the papers that I've mentioned. There's this beautiful paper of Desiree and Grecos from 1979, some papers of me and Erdős, um, uh, the paper of Hennefeld. And um, uh, if anyone is interested in the details of the proof, I'm certainly happy to uh, talk with you, uh, you know, any time for the duration of the, of the conference. But at this point, I'm going to stop. Thank you.